have also been a way of facilitating the UC Berkeley researchers um, in getting to know the local people, both the European American settlers and the tribal members. So that's been extremely rewarding and um, besides friendships with many of you here, that was certainly one of the reasons I wanted to join ARF and thank you very much <coughs> because of uh, deep interest in wanting to learn more about our coastal tribes. <coughs> I wanted to tell you, in case you're not aware of it, that um, UC has 40 natural areas of significant size protected for natural history research. And um, Berkeley manages five of these, including the Angela Reserve, which will be the center for the story I'll tell you today. But we, Berkeley manages <coughs> five, and <coughs> we have these thanks to the fact that one of the founding professors was in the capstone year of his PhD on fringe tone lizards when he came and found they built a, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> running, <coughs> they built a motel over his study population. So <coughs> to put it in shorthand, he didn't get, thank you so much, Meg. Oh, <laughs> he didn't get mad, he got even. <coughs> thank you, could you give that to Meg? <laughs> And, and he um, got all of his rancher friends to donate lands to UC for natural reserves, with the idea being that you can study nature there, but you can't leave a heavy footprint the way the agriculture or forestry reserves might. <coughs> Certainly, they're very suitable for archaeological research and human cultural research. Bill's already expanded us into geology, geomorphology, and, and hydrology. <coughs> I'll go through this quickly, but I thought you guys might be interested in the human history of the reserve that I'm talking about, which is in the headwaters <coughs> of the South Fork of the Eel River. It's about an 8,000 acre reserve now, and <coughs> it was originally saved by Heath and Marjorie Angelo, who had funds from San Francisco businesses went and bought land, bought up more land as farmers started going broke in the early 1900s. <coughs> but um, soon they had more land than they could afford to pay the taxes on. So Marjorie had heard of the Nature Conservancy. <coughs> Angela was the first gift to the Nature Conservancy <coughs> west of the Mississippi. Here's their homestead. And their grandson, Peter Steele, um, is the only paid employee now, the steward of Angelo Reserve. He's been amazing. <coughs> when it came under UC management, we were able to do a lot of crazy looking experiments there that would never stand up under park, national parks or nature conservancy lands. You, I don't know the degree to which archaeologists would like to do manipulative experiments, but if they don't leave a long-term legacy on the land, you're welcome to use these reserves for that. <coughs> Under Bill's leadership, we got involved a lot more with hydrology and earth sciences. Sorry, I always get asthma when I run through an airport, too. <laughs> Not real asthma, it just feels like it. So um, we also got some gifts. There's a decent little lab there that you could, where you could do wet lab stuff. There are classrooms that are comfortable for 30 to even 50 students if you open the bar doors. So just realize these are UC Berkeley, UC facilities. If you want a <coughs> workshop or to check it out for research, visit. <coughs> Bill. And his colleagues have informed us a lot about what water and trees are doing on the critical zone, which I think he was lecturing to you about. <coughs> and I wanted to show you the operation that he went through to get a slant drilled Vados zone monitoring system to watch rock moisture and, and um, critical zone moisture <coughs> under the earth with a slant drilled well that lets you look at the evolution of water, gases, microbes, without disrupting a water column in a well. 
and they get <coughs> a ridiculous number of signals back a minute from wired up network. So that's what we have going in terms of hydrology and geomorphology and it's greatly informed ecology. <coughs> this um, <coughs> is the way we envision the ecology tying into the critical zone that water is crucial, of course, to river ecology, to the coastal oceans, to vegetation. And the critical zone <coughs> determines the storage of the water and therefore how long we have surface water or runoff after it stopped raining. And <coughs> Bill and his colleagues are really interested in the parts that the trees are extracting, the part that is left to run off. <coughs> and when they were just starting their operation, I'd met Ron Reed and Bill Tripp and some other Karuk members through the friendships with Tom Carlson, who's an ethnobotanist in our department. They visited Angelo. They're looking at Bill's <coughs> brain surgery. And Ron has commented that, well, if you let us manage the forest the way our grandparents did, we'd have more cold runoff late into the spring for the fish. And so this is an interesting hypothesis that I think Bill and his colleagues are testing with technology, and they tested with <coughs> long knowledge. So I wanted to comment that we think of this northern, northwestern part of California, especially southern Californians, think of us as being relatively water rich. <coughs> That's true. Well, we get these beautiful atmospheric rivers that Les Roundtree depicted in this fabulous Bait Nature article, which I use every time I teach, even Bio One, <coughs> with these atmospheric rivers slamming into the north coast. We have gotten epic floods in this region that have wiped out towns and bridges. But as you all also know, we had four and a half years of severe drought there also. <coughs> and um, as the ridge held its place, the Eel River, which drains almost 10,000 square kilometers, went dry, totally dry, near the mouth, for the first time in recorded written history. <coughs> People said, well, if it had to happen, it's good it happened in September because the fish had already gotten out and then we didn't have the big fish getting stuck in a warming puddle upstream if the river was that dry. But there are also consequences for the rest of the food web, including the primary producers. Most of the watershed is nourished by thin skins of algae on rocks <clears throat> or more copious growths of algae that grow on macroalgae. And those species change depending on hydrology. You can have very, very, very good, highly nutritious diatoms dominating in a year, but you can also get overgrowths of toxic cyanobacteria, which are getting notorious now for killing dogs, neurotoxic cyanobacteria in our system. I'll tell you more about this, <clears throat> just reminding all of us, which we don't need, I'm sure, that it's a Mediterranean system with summer droughts, winter floods, and so you, you can really have <coughs> combinations of winter and summer hydrology that affect what the algae and the food web are going to do and therefore whether they'll support salmon or cyanobacteria, the toxic ones. Dry winter I'm calling just a winter that doesn't move the bed. Low flow winter. This is maybe a total of 300 cubic meters a second. This is only 10 here for scale. Wet winters normally move the bed once or more. That makes a big difference for how much algae you get. <clears throat> a wet summer, well, we're modest in our goals. A wet summer just has high enough base flow that the main stem sunny pools stay gently flushed and they generally stay cooler than about 25 degrees C. Dry s summer uh, gets much more stressful than that with things warming and stagnating. And that's what causes most of the trouble. <clears throat> about uh, 25 years of work went into this little diagram and I won't bore you with it, but you can read about it if you're interested. <clears throat> if you have a scouring flood, you wipe out big predator-resistant grazers, 
that gives the algae a window of time in which they bloom like crazy. And then <clears throat> over the summer, faster growing edible soft insects come in, good fish food, mayflies, midges, and they feed the higher trophic levels, the predators, including salmon. So a scouring flood gives you a salmon supporting state, a lack of flood scour over the winter produces a summer in which these big armored grazers get all the algae and less goes to salmon. We also see this downstream from dams if we've taken away natural flood scour. <clears throat> After a flood scour, you get a barren bed of fur first before things recover, then the algae recovers first. It becomes green and many meters long. It then starts senescing and warming a little bit in the summer, turning yellow and then reddish color. And let me tell you what those colors mean. They mean something really important for ecological nutrition. <clears throat> the growths of green algae start out clean and green, but I like to say that this macroalgae, Clodophora is the name, begins its life with green hair, then she turns into a blonde when she's middle-aged, then she becomes a redhead in her older age. So early summer, midsummer, late summer, what's going on? <clears throat> what's going on is that is a rough-skinned green alga host that gets epiphytized, just as strangler figs epiphytize trees, diatoms epiphytize these algae. This is about the diameter of a human hair, this green clodophora strand that you see in the scanning EM. And it's covered with diatoms, initially just a monolayer of diatoms that either glue themselves on or attach with gelatin stalks. <clears throat> so that's when it looks blonde. It has just a thin layer of carotenoids and looks yellow. When it starts getting this rusty red color, there's been a transition to very deep layers, five to 10 cells deep, of a, a special diatom that the more we learn about it, the more awesome it seems to be. <clears throat> this diatom's epithemia. It comes on mid to late summer when the flows have slowed down, when the river is more nitrogen limited than it was previously. And epithemia has two tricks. One is they're very mobile. They can cruise around so they can pile up on each other's shoulders and take their turn in the sunlight or getting some fresh water. <clears throat> the other is that they host an endosymbiotic cyanobacteria. So live epithemia, you can make out the endosymbionts, cyanobacteria that live within the host diatoms here, but they're easier to see here because the diatom's dead. It's just showing us its glass frustral or shell, and the blue-green symbionts, the cyanobacteria, are on their way out too because they require the diatom. They don't have either photosystem. They can't fix their own carbon but they can fix atmospheric nitrogen. And with that atmospheric nitrogen, they make all the amino um, acids required for protein. So the epithemia turns out to be just a superfood. It there's a lot of it. It encrusts the coast, and it makes, the diatom itself makes PUFAs. <clears throat> uh, if you had a handful of these diatoms, you'd say, my hand smells fishy, but my algal guru, who you will meet in a few slides, Rex Lau, says, no, fish smell diatomy because the polyunsaturated fatty acids that make us healthy when we eat salmon came from their algal <clears throat> food base through their prey. Carotenoids are the vitamins that our plant sunglasses, really, and um, accessory photosynthetic pigments. <clears throat> and then all these amino acids, this was just found out fairly recently by a Japanese team who sequenced epithemia and found it can't do anything except for some reason make all the amino acids from the protein, from the nitrogen that it fixes. And this is great for the diatom, but it's even greater for the grazers. <clears throat> so epithemia is preferred, voraciously consumed, and supports really fast growth for all of the algivores, all the grazers in this food web, the snails, the tadpoles, and these insect larvae, midges. So if you ask the midge what it's been eating, or if it can't answer, you can look at its poop. You can see empty epithemia frustrals are almost entirely its diet. 
You could also make that inference if you just looked at the little retreats that they weave. They settle into the rusty algae and they clean up the neighborhood, turning it green around where they're reaching out and grazing. So these things are built of epithemia. And <clears throat> if you enclose rusty algae, you get about 25 times per area more bug meat emerging from the river with the epithemia under these emergence traps than you get with green or, or yellow algae. So epithemia is a superfood. <clears throat> what happens downstream? The Angelo and, and you guys, if you use these reserves, should think of them as stepping stones to a region, not just, not just um, protected places, but stepping stones to a region for research. And <clears throat> we and other Angelo researchers have gone all the way down to the mouth looking at the rivers. And fortunately or unfortunately, there are many places all the way down where you can still wade across the Eel River because the land use and the super floods knocked a lot of sediments into that river, made it much wider and shallower. So we can do these transects to keep track of algae and find that the algae downstream is similar to the algae upstream, maybe a little bit accelerated seasonally where it's warmer. <clears throat> But what happens when you take this river algae and introduce it into the estuary or the coastal ocean? And that was the interest of Charlene Ng, who completed her um, dissertation a few years ago. <clears throat> she did these what we call cafeteria experiments. The eel being a short, steep river is kind of gravelly through a lot of its estuary, <clears throat> more than flatter rivers would be. <clears throat> the gravels are full of little amphipods and isopods, little crustacea, not insects anymore, but in the saltwater of crustacea that are feeding the shorebirds and also feeding, importantly, salmon that are gaining their last growth and length before they head out to the ocean where they'll be facing gauntlets of predators as well as a lot more food. <clears throat> so Charlene transplanted river algae and compared how much these little grazers liked it um, versus the soft green marine algae like sea lettuce and enteromorpha. The estuarine ecologists who didn't look upstream thought that was the base of their food web along with marine diatoms. But if you ask the amphipods, they find the seaweeds really boring compared to the delicious river imported, experimentally imported algae. <clears throat> so <clears throat> put these little split pipette choices before them with sea lettuce, another marine seaweed, or epiphytized clodophora, and it disappears within minutes, which makes it a hidden carbon source for the estuary. So how do you find out how much river algae is entering the estuary if it disappears right away? Oh, you put these sayings across the river, and Charlene found one miracle cross section right below the Fern Bridge. For those of you who know, that's just where the river is about to turn brackish at the highest extent of saltwater intrusion. So we did that, and even at low flow, you could get almost all the way across, but couldn't quite hold the nets down in some of the fast areas. So heroic Berkeley undergraduates stepped on them and got pushed back and back and back as they held the cross section, maybe <clears throat> um, five, 10 meters sometimes, but they maintained the cross section for their 10 minutes and we got the data. <clears throat> and for two years, Charlene was able to show that most of the organic matter coming out of that river going to the coastal ocean is algal. Algae detach in midsummer and start moving. And it's only this year in November when we had the first bank full scouring flood that much of the terrestrial matter moves out. Terrestrial matter is considered the major terrestrial export from rivers in terms of carbon budgets. And that may be true because the stuff moves out in a pulse and then it gets buried because it moves out too fast for consumers to eat it in the river or in the estuary. But so in terms of carbon sequestration, that matters. But in terms of trophic subsidies from the river to the estuary, we're excited that this algae was underappreciated and may be pretty important. OK, so that's what happens with a wet winter. You get wet winter, you get an adequate flow in the summer, and you get salmon state with yummy stuff going up through a food web and supporting salmon. <clears throat> And remember, if you don't have that scour in a dry winter, you and but say it's sufficient flow so the native species are still OK, you get dicosmica state. And you can still produce some salmon, but not as much. <clears throat> Here's the problem. It's 
either kind of winter, but it's worse if it's wet, followed by an extremely dry summer. And then you go from salmon supporting state to cyanobacteria state. Here's <clears throat> what happens. Um, first, the, the good rusty algae gets blackened, and I'll show you what that means, but these, the, this is the dying diatom, this is the bad guy. Okay, so here's the problem. How would you get such a dry summer if you had decent winter flows? And the reason we can see that now is extraction of water by marijuana in July when the plants need six gallons a minute per plant and the river needs the water the most. So July, August extraction is the problem. <clears throat> Those of you who have followed this probably know the work of Scott Bauer, who's a Department of Fish and Wildlife wild agent who's jumping out of helicopters with the wardens. The wardens just take the plants. He measures how many plants per greenhouse and <clears throat> how many plants per outdoor grow and can do the calculations to estimate that the density of grows can dry up entire fairly large watersheds in summer. That was the case in 2015, before legalization. And those of you <clears throat> probably know also that the legalization road is very bumpy and we're right in the middle of a lot of bumps and potholes in, in that path too, but it's important. <clears throat> so the other thing that the illegal growers were doing is building these poorly engineered holding ponds and roads and all of the recovery that the river had started to make from the brutal logging of the 50s through the 70s was undone in certain regions by the erosion from their land use. Okay, here's, here's the story back to the algae. This is the worst possible case. We had a winter, December, big scouring flood, so no grazers. Then it was sunny in 70 pr practically the whole summer until we got a tiny little spate in June. And during this long growth window, Clodophora got huge, no, not grazed, plenty of sunshine to grow in. And then this little spate, because it was so long, it was enough to tug it loose, but it wasn't enough to export it to the ocean. So we got these masses, giant masses of <clears throat> stagnating algal mats that got very hot. The temperature in the mat is getting up towards 40, and the temperature just a few centimeters below in the water is cooled and moderated by the water heat capacity, so it stays reasonable. But this is a temperature that kills diatoms. So I hope you have now empathy for a diatom. It should, if it's happy, it's orange. <clears throat> if it's unhappy, it's lost those orange pigments, and now it's bleeding its chlorophyll out into the matrix. So all of that material, phosphorus and nitrogen that makes the pigments, the death of the diatom is fueling algae in the mat that can tolerate the heat. And unfortunately for our futures on Earth, cyanos like it hot. <laughs> so this is a little yarn ball of anabena. It's a potentially neurotoxic cyanobacteria. It's, this is the same little yarn ball. It's curling up in the mat probably to protect itself from sun and um, UV, but <clears throat> as soon as it soaks up the dead diatom nutrients and other nutrients, it will unfurl and colonize the residual rusty colored good algae and blacken them. So if you look underwater, this region here is a stretch of river that's hot and stagnant, and the front of cyanobacterially overgrown algae stops here, and here's good algae, <laughs> just in the foreground. So this is what it looks like underwater. You have these former, re I'll show you a closer picture of this, but basically my student who specialized in studying this stuff, Keith Bauman Gregson, called them spires. I think he was thinking of Mordor or something. And here's what the algo looks like in a micrograph. So here's a picture that really shows what it does. You see the rusty red algae, then you see a few specks of blue, green, or dark green material growing on it. They coalesce as they grow vegetatively, smother the host alga, and have their way with it. Then the host alga starts rotting. This is the good stuff. And the cyanobacteria is so happy digesting the nutrients and 
using this as a support to get to the sun, that it produces a lot of photosynthetic bubbles, which eventually buoy it off the host, and it then floats and can collect in backwaters where dogs encounter it. They jump in the wrong backwater, they lick their fur, and they die in convulsions, sometimes within 20 or 30 minutes. <clears throat> so um, over, over about a dozen dog deaths have been reported, and probably there are a lot more in the eel, and then there are also some in the Russia River, which have gotten more news in the Bay Area. Here's Keith, the graduate student who got his PhD studying um, cyanos. He teamed with Rafael Kudela at Santa Cruz to measure the neurotoxin and the liver toxins that were circulating in the eel and found that unlike Southern California and Central California and the Klamath, uh, neurotoxins seem prevalent here, more, more uh, concentrated than um, the hepatotoxins or the microcystins that they're having trouble with up in the Klamath River, although they haven't really measured there for neurotoxins, so they need to find out everything they've got with a little bit more monitoring. Keith reached out to citizens like Pat Higgins, who runs a citizen's recovery project, first addressed it bringing salmon back, but then addressed it warning people about cyanobacteria and figuring out what we could do about them. And so Pat's been a wonderful friend and partner in watershed monitoring and, and surveillance. And <clears throat> There's um, reason to be concerned about whether these toxins get to the ocean. Here it's the coast of California, obviously, and here's the mouth of the Eel River. I'm not saying all of this, this dark red is um, high concentrations of chlorophyll. And what you see off the Eel rivals what you see off of San Francisco Bay. Not necessarily just because of the algae, because there's marine upwelling delivering nitrogen, but sometimes you see these blooms when the upwelling is not happening. So we're interested in what the rivers are exporting to the coastal ocean. Are they going to be delivering yummy stuff, nutritious algae, or are they going to be delivering potentially toxic algae? And it's a concern, especially with liver toxins, which are the cyanotoxins that damage livers are a little bit more chemically stable. And <clears throat> people working in Rafael Kudel's lab, Melissa Miller, among others, have found over 20 dead sea otters off the Monterey River coast that died of hepatotoxins. Those um, microcystins had to be produced in the agriculturally contaminated rivers that flow into Monterey Bay and then out to the coast. So there is a potential promise and a potential threat of river subsidies to coastal ocean food webs. And after some decades of nerdy algal studies and food web studies, the neighbors suddenly got very interested in our research. <laughs> and we were incredibly lucky. Before that had happened, just for fun, we'd started having algal forays, where you go gather algae from various habitats, then bring the gang back and look at it under microscopes. And, and um, th those are led by two very dear friends of mine, Rex Lau and Paula. Fury. You'll see close-ups of them later. Here's Keith with his algae. And <clears throat> we've done this every odd year um, since uh, 2011, actually. The group's gotten bigger. Angelo's classroom hosts people who've come in and never looked down a microscope before, and they're diffident and shy at first, and then three hours later, under Rex's tutelage, you can't get them to break for beer. They're competing with each other. Oh, that's just Nostock, but did you see what I've got? You know, It's just so fun to see them open their eyes and then just get delighted at the beauty and the diversity and the fascination and the mystery of what goes on at 200 or 400 X <laughs> under the scope. So that's a huge gift that Rex has given to, you know, basically North America, but including our groups. And a lot of the tribal members have come and taken these courses several years in a row. So we um, learn from them walking through the woods a lot, and they learn from Rex and Paula, and I, I have other people coming in talking about ecology. And this is how playful Rex is. He makes flags that have algae on them, so everything's algae. <clears throat> but it was, um, here's, that's, this is Rex, and here's Paula, his PhD student who postdoc with me and is teaching at a, a university in 
Minneapolis and is also a great taxonomist, great photographer, microphotographer, and inspired teacher about algae. So in 2017, the Yurok tribal members who had come a couple of times said, look, we'll, we'll sponsor you. And so when they came to Angela, we had to make them pay for their dinners, you know, $70 a piece for a weekend, and then we cook. But, and, and, but um, they just hosted us, <laughs> provided the food. It was incredibly fun. We went um, to, their, to a, a lodge that they rented in the lower Klamath and um, collected algae from their tributaries, including the Blue Creek tributary that they really prize, and the various places on the river. And we went down with Merle on the flatboat, collected algae all around the estuary. I was thinking the eels about 10,000 square kilometers, the Klamath about 70,000 kilometers square kilometers. How do you study the Klamath? But it turns out that these flatboats really get around. So you, it, it is actually feasible to do a lot of ecology if you are collaborating with this tribal environmental program, the YTEP guys. And um, it was just a wonderful experience. Many, many long conversations over campfires with incredible stories. So, including marijuana encounters. <laughs> so here's another picture of that group. But I'll just um, end, and we'll have a little time for questions, believe it or not, um, by saying we need eyes on the eel, but they really need eyes on the Klamath because in 2022, the dams are coming out. It was initially scheduled for 2020, those four dams that they, the three, three main tribes, the Karuk, the Hoopa, and the Yurok, kept flying back and forth to DC and they finally um, prevailed in getting the dams removed and getting federal funds to cover the liability of Pacific Corps for the, um, whatever ha might happen after the dams come out. <clears throat> so these dams are coming out. Um, it's lucky that it was set back a couple of years because we need to have better documentation. The, the Yurok Tribe Environmental Program, the Karuk, other folks are taking data and taking very good data, especially on fish invertebrates. Nobody's really tracking the algae yet. So they're interested though because algae are directly a health problem, not just for salmon supporting food webs, but for the mussels, as you probably know from, from Ron Reed and Kerry Norgard's studies of food security of the Karuk. You can't eat mussels if it's filtered this stuff. So these dams come out, it's going to be amazing. And the eel estuary is actually not that different than the Klamath estuary. They're both relatively simple estuaries. What will connecting the river do to the river food webs and also to what the rivers deliver? So it takes a huge amount of person power to do that. The tribes are uh, in a great position, but they certainly could use boots on the ground type help. So if any of you or your students might be interested in getting involved in this, there's a, a need. And I'll just end on this slide. We have some idea now of what the climate regimes that have been in the range that we've studied since 1988 can do. Dry winters, wet winters, wet summers, and, and with drought, extremely dry summers. Um, and I like to think of these as nested webs with this Clodophora has a little community ecosystem of algae that are fixing carbon, fixing nitrogen, um, methylating mercury in some cases. They're doing a lot of biochemical mischief and magic at this level in a little community. How much of that there is depends on how much green stuff there is. That depends on hydrology, also the food web, who's grazing it, who's protecting it from being grazed. The food web depends in part on time but also space, whether it's setting up in sunny areas or dark tributaries. And all of this talks to each other across all of these scales in a fascinating way to determine what the relationship of the river to the ocean is. And the relationship of both the ocean and the river to people is something I'm incredibly and increasingly interested in. And so welcome your guidance and um, interaction in, in continuing to understand that. So thanks very much and sorry to be late. <laughs> Are you taking questions?
Yep.
So, yeah. you, so in the in the more stagnant, problematic, dead, poisonous to dogs' water, there are there diatoms there, or it's just too hot for any diatom to live in. Is that what I hear you saying? Yeah, I would have before I confidently said that I'd have to go look for diatoms. But when we've looked in those mats, for example, they're mostly dead. Okay. Yeah, but I'll say that um, diatoms. <clears throat> I had Trump me, beat pollen um, for environmental indicators, yeah. as you may know, and for paleo environmental recreation because they don't blow in from anywhere. Yeah. And they're very I'm working on. I'm just finished cool. paper right now with the diatoms. <laughs> That's very <laughs> neat. Yes. So once you look at diatoms, you tend to fall in love. So. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any thoughts or predictions on how the, the food lab may change with the dam removal? Challenging question like Meg's. <laughs> they, um, the food web that the Oregon State University folks and the tribes have been really concerned about is what happens behind the dam, a lot of put off our accumulation, and then that hyper eutrophication, which is defined as you can't wash your hands in it, the picture you saw. So that comes out, and um, the Hyper, the blooms, even of the neutral structural clodophora, foster tuberous and worms that host two infectious pathogens, parasites of the salmon. So it's another little cycle spinning that harms the salmon. When the dams come out, we're hoping to lose those disease organisms. And um, the problem with the Klamath, as those of you who know it, is that it is kind of an upside down river. The Klamath Lake is naturally eutrophic, you now with agriculture hyper-eutrophic. And so without those dams in place, it's, it's going to be warm and a little bit nutrient-rich. And you won't be able, people are concerned that you won't be able to use the stored deep-release water to cool the river in summer. But I'm not sure how skilled we really are at managing, engineering nature like that anyway. And, and um, I think the added habitat and more natural flow regime and the lack of these huge artifacts that are reservoir effects, hopefully will be that beneficial.